So you need to be aware of the uh, cardiac life support protocol when it comes to managing the foreign body bronchus. So a child who chokes on something which it was eating, the first thing you need to find out is the child is conscious and able to cough. So if the child is conscious and able to cough, ask the child to do so. This can easily expel the foreign body in some, some children. Again, it may not work or in situations where the child is unconscious or becomes unconscious or the obstruction is very severe, they cannot generate a, a forceful cough. Situation is going to get from bad to worse. So what can you do in this situation? If it is a child, which is by child I mean if it's more than one year, you do what is called the Hemlich maneuver. Hemlich maneuver is you do a, a forceful upward and backward thrust with your two arms locked together and you press on the child's epigastrium and you do forceful jerks. This will increase the intrathoracic pressure and it could, could expel the foreign body. Briefly about anatomy of the stomach. So um, you can see here that the stomach has a, a fundus, a fundus here, you have a body here, you have a, a pylorus, pyloric antrum and you have the pyloric sphincter. So in pyloric stenosis what happens is the entire pylorus is hypertrophied and you, you have a obstruction basically at the gastric outlet. So this is a condition which has a male preponderance in the ratio of 5 is to 1. For some reason it tends to occur more commonly in the first born child. And the symptoms tend to vary depending on the degree of the hypertrophy in the pyloric muscle. And the onset of symptoms interestingly is only at 3 or 4 weeks after birth. Why is that? Because initially when they are born, the muscle is uh, looking normal. But with, with time it tends to hypertrophy and cause the symptoms. So um, I will show the diagrams accordingly to each one of them. Now in this picture you can see the first one you have the trachea. So that's the trachea and uh, that is the proximal end of the esophagus towards the mouth and that's the distal end. So you see there is a, a big gap here. So in this situation this is basically a complete atresia which basically means there is no communication between the upper and the lower end of the esophagus. Nor is there a fistula between the trachea and the esophagus. So this is one presentation. The second one is says is a proximal fistula where you have an esophageal atresia proximally. However, there is a communication in this situation between the proximal end of the esophagus and the trachea. So you have this called condition called the proximal fistula. The third one is the most common variety of uh, tracheal esophageal fistula. It is seen in 85% of the patients. This point is very important. Now we all know what is FRC. It is the functional residual capacity. Functional residual capacity is is very important for anesthetists because it basically indicates the oxygen reserve we have when we have a uh, apneic period. And what determines the functional residual capacity? It is a balance between two compliances: compliance of chest wall versus compliance of the lung. So we all know that the lung tends to recoil inwards whereas the chest tends to recoil outwards. In children what happens is they have a very compliant chest wall which is three to four, six times higher than the lung, lung compliance. So basically what this uh, translates to is the FRC is lower and it tends to encroach the closing capacity in a small child. So during normal respiration a significant percent of the alveoli could be closed in a small child. So, which basically means they will be more susceptible to hypoxia when you have an apneic episode. So, this is a very common um, surgery we encounter among the plastic surgeons. And it's one of the commonest defects uh, we see. So, um, the incidence uh, varies across different uh, races. So, However, in Indians, it's, it's approximately 1.27 per thousand live births, the highest being in Americans. Uh, they could uh, occur as an isolated defect or as a part of a syndrome. 
So 20 to 30 percent could have associated syndrome or systemic abnormalities which has to be uh, looked into. Now um, this is a common exam question uh, for post-graduate uh, post exams. So uh, it's something uh, which they would get regularly, regularly as a minor case. So and embryology is something which is uh, frequently asked. So if you look at this picture, the phase develops from these three uh, processes. One is the, the frontal nasal process, the maxillary process and the mandibular process.